So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our guest speaker today, who's Dr. Rayan Zafar from Imperial College London. And Rayan is a UKRI postdoctoral fellow at the Centre for Psychedelic Research and Neuropsychopharmacology. And he's also a senior researcher at Drug Science. And Rayan works closely with Professor David Nutt, one of the world's uh, leading drug scientists and psychiatrists. And very exciting for us, Rayan is leading uh, the world's first clinical and mechanistic study of psilocybin uh, for for the lay for those who don't uh, know it that for that that's commonly called magic mushrooms and so Rayan is looking at psilocybin therapy and in gambling addiction and that's going to be the focus of his talk today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rayan to um, take us through um, his very interesting research. Thank you, Rayan. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, the introduction, Sharon. And it's great to um, great to hear that actually um, your research is happening, which focuses on interdisciplinary um, kind of collaborations, because what I'll be focusing a lot of my talk on today is about therapeutics and understanding, I guess, the neurobiology of, of gambling addiction, but also beyond, beyond just developing new treatments, there needs to be a lot of work done, as I'm sure we all are all aware in public health and regulation and policy. Um, and so, yeah, to really tackle addiction, it is important that we have a kind of uh, multifaceted lens. So uh, today's talk will be about um, the silo gambling study as we've named it. Um, and some of the individuals working on that um, are listed here. Um, and that's been done at the Center for Psychedelic Research. So our research group uh, was the first uh, dedicated uh, research center to study psychedelics so over five years ago by Professor Robin Carhart Harris and uh, Professor David Nutt. Um, and since then, we did the world's first brain imaging studies and the first uh, with psychedelic drugs and also the, uh, the world's first clinical trial in depression. Um, and more recently, we've gone into different areas, different clinical areas, and an area that I'm working close to is addiction and also specifically uh, gambling addiction, which was the focus of um, a lot of my PhD. Um, so a bit of a summary, I'm sure many people on the call may already know a lot of this, but these are the most latest figures um, from the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities report published late last year, um, which looked at the prevalence of gambling uh, disorder in the UK, and it categorised the levels of harms that individuals with a potential problematic or perhaps even gambling addiction had, and they categorised individuals based on two, uh, four levels. Um, you can see over here that around 1.6 million adults may benefit from some type of treatment. Um, around 970,000 may benefit from something that they call a level two intensity treatment, which may involve maybe two or three sessions of motivational interviewing. But then there's around a quarter of a million individuals in the UK right now which need a more intensive sort of treatment, uh, something that's categorized as level four intensity, um, which typically now involves around eight to 14 sessions of CBT, but also it could be dynamic, psychodynamic therapy. And we think it's these people in the level four that may benefit from some of the treatment modalities that I'll go on to explain. Um, so there is a significant need to innovate treatment based on the numbers of individuals that I just described, but also, because there isn't any currently available regulated medicine for patients with a gambling disorder in the UK. So general practitioners and psychiatrists are able to prescribe, and in particular naltrexone um, is a medication that's prescribed off-label, um, it's unlicensed, and that helps regulate um, opiateergic function, which can help with regulations of craving. Um, more recently, there's been some work uh, done with ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, um, in gambling disorder with some very interesting um, early results in an open label study. Um, but the main bulk of treatment for patients with gambling disorder in services is talking therapy um, plus group therapy. And there's a few issues with that. And the first is that it doesn't seem to be largely effective. The rates of relapse are quite high. Um, and I think more importantly, actually, is that there's a very limited number of patients that are actually receiving these treatments. There's only around 3% of individuals with a gambling disorder receiving any treatment, which signifies that there is a significant treatment gap. And that's probably twofold. And the first, actually threefold, the first is stigma related to the condition. I think the second is probably related 
um, to the lack of services that are able to provide the treatment. And the third is probably the lack of effective treatment. So there are probably the three reasons I'd say why uh, we have such a high treatment gap in gambling addiction, but this also extends to other addictions too. Um, and this was from uh, Dame Carol Black's recent report from Harm to Hope, part one, um, where she described after doing extensive research that despite the huge societal damage and cost of almost 19 billion a year caused by addiction, so this says to illegal drug, but actually gambling is involved underneath that, there is still limited clinical or public health innovation. So this is now, now seen as a global health issue uh, and a public health issue, which really needs some innovation into. And one place that we as a team um, have started to look at is the potential role for psychedelics. Um, so with a bit of an introduction, psychedelics come from the description of two words. And the first is psyche, which describes the mind or soul. And the second um, is a Greek word delos, which means manifest or visible. So the culmination of the two words, psyche and delos, describe the kind of phenomenology or the experiential account of individuals who take these, um, take these drugs. And, and that describes making the mind manifest or the soul visible. So that's often, uh, and it's illustrated in this beautiful piece of artwork here, uh, individuals generally tend to kind of unlock what is perhaps known as the ego or the unconscious mind and kind of let themselves free. Now there's different kinds of psychedelic drugs um, and these are examples of what we call classic psychedelic drugs. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about why we call them that in a second, um, but the one that's been kind of at the forefront of modern clinical research up until now, or actually, yeah, the kind of forerunner is psilocybin, was mentioned uh, by Sharon that comes from magic mushrooms, but psilocybin is a bioactive compound that enters systemic circulation after ingesting magic mushrooms, um, and it gets converted into psilocin, which is the prodrug in the brain where it engages with brain receptor targets to elicit its effect. Um, then we have drugs like DMT, um, which are found in specific plants, um, often in South America in a brew called ayahuasca. Um, you have other classic psychedelics, mescaline, which come from a specific cactus, 5-MeO-DMT, which is secreted by a toad in the Sonoran Desert in Mexico. Um, but you can also get synthetic classic psychedelics like LSD, which was uh, manufactured and um, discovered by Albert Hoffman, who's seen in this picture, in 1938, and was actually then synthesized and used as kind of like the kind of archetypal synthetic uh, classic psychedelic for medical and clinical research and treatment um, as well. So as I mentioned, the classic serotonergic psychedelics um, have a long history actually. Um, use of psychedelics have actually stretched back to perhaps maybe 10,000 years as archeological evidence uh, that psilocybin was at least used then. And this is from images of, of uh, mushroom men in caves in Northern Spain and also uh, Algeria. But it wasn't really until sort of the 1930s that it started finding itself into modern medicine. And that was from Albert Hoffman, who synthesized LSD-25. And you can see a bottle of that there. And he was working for a company called Sandos, uh, which are now a pharmaceutical company called Novartis. Um, and uh, they essentially patented LSD-25, uh, manufactured it and distributed it, uh, as I mentioned, to the medical and psychiatric community and they called it Delisid. And so um, there was a wave of research that happened during the uh, 60s and 70s, um, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a second. Uh, but that's kind of the history of classic serotonergic psychedelics and psilocybin uh, fits under that. And the reason why we call these classic psychedelics is because they look very similar to the compound, um, the neurotransmitter in the brain serotonin, and they also bind to the same receptor, the serotonin 2A receptor. We have a different class of psychedelic drugs, uh, which are otherwise, I guess, known as empathogens or intactogens. And an archetypal version of this is MDMA, although there are some other, other different derivatives with different uh, chemical structures. But MDMA was again found itself in the pharmaceutical sector under a company called Merck. And it was um, it found its place in, in psychological and psychiatric services uh, in the US actually. 
uh, in the 1970s where it was discovered to have profound effects on mood. Um, and it was originally called empathy, um, whereas uh, a lot of people often misinterpret that it was called ecstasy originally. So actually a uh, common to, um, or a common myth is that actually ecstasy uh, was originally a recreational drug, whereas actually in reality, it was a psychological or psychodynamic enhancing drug um, that actually found its place more in medicine as opposed to the dance floors. Um, and then finally, we have a, a final class of drugs that we're investigating in psychiatry and psychopharmacology at the moment, and that's ketamine. Um, again, discovered as a medicine uh, originally, and actually the World Health Organization lists it as one of its top 50 medicines. Um, and that's because in sub-Saharan Africa, um, it's used commonly um, as an anesthetic because individuals don't need intubation, uh, much like they do with drugs like propofol and other general anesthetics that we use in uh, Western medicine. Um, and so these are kind of a bit of a summary of the main drugs, although there are some others that are currently under investigation for different conditions such as uh, depression, but also addiction. In fact, all of these drugs that I mentioned here are either being trialed or have been trialed as a potential treatment for addiction. Um, now, what we know about psychedelics, I won't go too much into the pharmacology here, um, but we know that psychedelics have their action or classic psychedelics have their action on the specific receptor, the serotonin 2A receptor. And if you look at the graph in the middle, uh, sorry, on the left-hand side, you can see that serotonin 2A receptors are expressed on the postsynaptic membrane. So there's about eight, seven billion neurons in the brain and we have different, different kinds of neurons, but we can have serotonergic neurons, which are expressed uh, kind of throughout the brain, um, starting off in midline brain structures, extending to the frontal cortex, throughout the limbic system, and throughout kind of emotional and memory circuits. Um, and it potentiates the, the way that the brain networks function. So we think that through kind of uh, interacting with the serotonin 2A receptor, we can actually change the way the brain networks communicate with each other. Um, interestingly, uh, we have the highest density of this kind of so-called psychedelic receptor in areas of the brain which are highlighted in red in this middle graph over here. And that, that area of the brain is uh, called the neocortex. It's the most evolutionary evolved part of the brain. Um, and it's part of the brain that we think is involved the most in abstract reasoning or um, kind of understanding the importance of of why we do things. So a simple way of understanding what the neocortex does might be maybe, you know, two, actually it was over 2000 years ago, but when the first kind of Neanderthal may have discovered fire, for example, what the discovery of fire in and, in and of itself is an interesting thing to kind of, to do and to be able to kind of figure out that that's, that's an important thing, but, but trying to prospect in the future as to why fire would be important for the beneficial advancement of civilization, we think that thinking is very specific to these neocortical areas of the brain. So it's part of the brains that really make us human. Um, so it's quite interesting that psychedelic receptors, such as serotonin 2A receptor, are expressed in this thing. We think it has a very important role in consciousness, but also kind of in kind of understanding our roles as humans, as sentient organisms. Um, we know that this serotonin 2A receptor is fundamental to the, the method of action of psychedelics in the brain as well as in that when we increase um, the occupancy at the receptor, so the more that we engage that serotonin 2A receptor with a psychedelic drug, um, the higher the intensity of the trip. And we know that when we block this receptor with a, a serotonin 2A antagonist, so a pharmacological blocker, we reduce the psychedelic effect. So we know that this is really kind of the lock and key um, into uh, experiencing these effects. So the effects under psychedelics are quite profound. Uh, many people often describe it as one of the top five life experiences. One of the studies we, uh, we've done over the years uh, was in healthy individuals who were psychedelic naive. And 95% of them said it was the weirdest experience of their lives, one of the strangest experiences of their lives. And 80% of them said it was in the top five life experiences. Um, so deeply profound um, states of altered consciousness. Um, and um, in terms of its safety profile, we know that these are remarkably safe drugs. So 
Um, a study up there that was done by uh, Dr. David Rizzo, one of the clinical directors in our centres, looks at the brains of individuals who are recreational psychedelic users. And basically in red over there, what you see is the density of serotonin transporters in the brain. Um, and there was a lot of hoo-ha in kind of the early 2000s about the impact of serotonergic drugs in the brain, like MDMA or potentially even psychedelics. But what we found was that individuals that um, um, recreationally use psychedelics, there's no change in serotonergic tissue function or serotonin transport function in the brain. So we know that they don't have very high brain toxicity, uh, which is contrary to popular belief. Um, and we know that they always have low physiological toxicity. So that means how much you have to take in order to have toxic effects. Uh, we know that it's about 70 kilograms of magic mushrooms are required to be ingested. Uh, so you basically have to eat me in, in the form of magic mushrooms in order to actually have any form of uh, physiological toxicity. So we, we know that these drugs are also non-addictive because they don't really tend to work, at least psilocybin, directly on the dopamine system, although there's some evidence for LSD working slightly on that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about dopamine in a bit, but what we think these drugs work on more is kind of recalibrating the reward system as opposed to kind of directly engaging it and potentiating it per se. Um, but obviously, um, when we look at drugs, um, it's important to kind of compare the harms versus known of the drugs. And this was um, a piece of work that was published in The Lancet by Professor Nutt and others at Drug Science over a decade ago, which has kind of become a bit of a meme on drug harms in use. Um, and uh, essentially what it describes is the culmination of opinion from experts working across addiction, psychopharmacologists, drug scientists, and it's comparing the harms of drugs uh, to users and the harms of drugs to self. And, and what these results kind of describe is that magic mushrooms, which you see right at the bottom of the kind of harms, um, really come, come in quite low. Um, and there's almost relatively no harm to others um, whilst, uh, whilst under it, taking in a safe environment. Whereas drugs like alcohol, which is commonly used in society today, really come out on top. So when we're thinking about safety, we do need to think about the kind of relative harms of these drugs. But that's not to say that these drugs don't come without uh, risks as well. So sometimes patients um, in trials or individuals that use these drugs recreationally may feel dysphoric or they may feel anxious. Uh, there's sometimes emergent side effects like nausea and headaches. Um, and there could be some false memories that come up that we want to investigate a bit more. But by and large, these kind of side effects are well managed um, if you use um, if used in um, appropriate um, settings with clinical supervision, which is what we do um, when we conduct our clinical trials. So as I mentioned before, if you don't believe our research on the harms of magic mushrooms, and these have been replicated by others um, in the EU and also Australia who did similar analyses, and they generally tend to come out um, with the same results which show that psychedelics and MDMA really aren't harmful drugs, um, whereas uh, the ones that are legal are not. So this kind of gives us confidence that um, our, kind of, kind, our kind of reasoning for using these drugs in terms of therapeutic sense um, can be justified. Um, and the reason why we think it's justified in gambling is because there has been um, a history of psychedelics being used to treat patients with substance use addictions. So if we go back to uh, some of the research I mentioned in the 60s and 70s, and this was done with LSD actually primarily, um, what you see here is a study um, which was done with opiate, individuals with heroin addiction, an opiate addiction, and at 12 months following one single large dose of LSD psychotherapy, Individuals that were given this one single dose, uh, a year later, 25% were abstinent, whereas those that were given placebo, only 5% were abstinent. So you had a six-fold better increase uh, chance in, in having abstinence if you were given LSD over placebo. Um, there was also trials done in alcohol addiction in a similar period. 500 patients were given either LSD or psilocybin, and if you were given this, uh, sorry, LSD or placebo, if you're given LSD, you were two times more likely um, at six months to have a reduction in drinking or abstinence if you're given placebo. Um, so um, this kind of earlier research um, kind of was, was banned, I guess, um, in 1971 um, as a result of the war on drugs, which started by uh, 
the president and um, some of the US um, for mainly political and moral reasons and not based on any medical and scientific sort of reasoning. And unfortunately that led to a dearth of research in psychedelics. But um, luckily um, in the last decade, uh, we've seen kind of what, what anthropolo anthropologists and historians call the psychedelic renaissance in science and research, many of which was catalyzed by some of my bosses, um, Professor David Knight and Robin Carhart, as well as some individuals in the US over here. And it was um, actually John Hopkins University, Matthew Johnson that did the world's first kind of addict, modern day clinical study in addiction uh, with tobacco smoking. And he found that at six months abstinence, uh, at six months following taking two high doses of psilocybin therapy, 80% were abstinent. So that's pretty impressive. Um, when you consider um, it in comparison to other, other medications which are currently licensed um, to reduce tobacco addiction, that's bupropion, which gives about 26.3%, and varenicline, which is 33.5%. So these are dopamine receptor agonists and antagonists specifically. So current pharmacological interventions don't seem to perform as well as psilocybin um, in this kind of open label study design. Um, more recently, alcohol and psilocybin uh, has been investigated, and you can see here similar kinds of um, results in, in studies which are kind of uh, larger phase two studies, placebo-controlled studies, and you see 41% reduction in um, heavy drinking days compared to placebo. Um, and uh, you can see over here in very recent uh, kind of case series uh, in a few patients in opiate and psilocybin, um, and actually we'll be beginning studies um, in parallel with the gambling research at our centre. So that will be the UK's first um, uh, study looking at um, the role of psilocybin in, in um, individuals being detoxified of opiate. Um, so um, if you're interested in that, um, there'll be more to come over the coming years. Um, but we're here to talk about addiction uh, to gambling. Um, but also what I want to discuss, I guess, is is the role of my research, which has really been looking at the mechanism of action of drugs and the mechanism of action of addiction as well. Because I think through understanding how both the brain works in addiction, but also how these drugs which show promise through clinical studies, will really be able to understand the core facets of, of gambling addiction, why it might happen, who may be more vulnerable, who may be more better responsive to certain treatments, but also really understand for the first time one of the most powerful drugs that have come to psychiatry and addiction, which we think are psychedelics. Um, and how they work is really something which we haven't really grappled with, although we have some kind of idea. And this is what we kind of have come to based on the research that we've had, is that psychedelics work potentially by initiating a cascade of neurobiological changes in the brain, and these manifest at different scales, which ultimately culminate in a relaxation of high level beliefs. So what that might be kind of apparent to an addiction might be these kind of cyclical habit based thoughts related to craving, related to behaviors around gambling, uh, related to kind of triggers. It might be that psychedelics may be able to kind of shunt those thoughts relax them, reframe them, and allow individuals to escape kind of from the cycles um, that their addictions hold them in. So how can we make a start in terms of understanding how psychedelics may work to rectify or, or change individuals' life courses um, that, work, that, that have um, issues with gambling addiction? And we can look at two parts of the brain. We can look at the kind of molecules of the mind, as I like to call them. So we can look at how psychedelics can change things like dopamine in the brain, which we know might be involved in addiction or endorphins. And we can also look at circuits and systems that may hold on to addiction. And one of these circuits that we look at um, and that I've been researching quite a lot over the last four or five years is the salience of the reward systems in the brain and how we can modulate these networks um, or how they might go wrong in addiction to maintain addiction behaviors. So the theoretical basis is quite simple, um, and it's something which has been um, put into this quite neat um, seminal thesis by Professor Ralph Metzner, who described addiction um, and transcendence as altered states of consciousness. I think this ties in quite well with our theory of 
of why psychedelics may work. And so he's, he describes transcendent and ecstatic experiences like the classic accounts of mystical or cosmic consciousness. They involve a widening of the focus of attention an expansion of awareness beyond the boundaries of the ordinary or baseline state. So that's kind of a state that we call the psychedelic state, an expansion beyond the ordinary state. But those kinds of experiences um, involve the opposite of what we call the addictive contractions of consciousness. So um, this graph shows essentially what I described as a 360 degree worldview. And in addiction, what happens and in gambling addiction, generally the focus of most of the cognitive resources and the attentional um, kind of uh, span is on, on gambling and gambling related activities. And so there's a contraction of this kind of conscious, uh, conscious state in the brain. Whereas, as I just mentioned, psychedelics, what we think they might do and what we actually know they do now, actually, is they expand this kind of conscious state. So they actually kind of force apart, you know, that very contracted state of being um, in the mind. And then finally, when you look at other drugs, such as like alcohol or cocaine or other recreational drugs, what they generally tend to do is they switch the lens through which you see or perceive reality. And so they don't increase consciousness, they don't decrease it, uh, like in addiction, but they just switch the lens through which you live. Um, so what we generally tend to see in, in patients with, with an addiction or with substance use disorders in the past is that when we, when we image their brains and we show them videos or images, clips related to what they're addicted to, their brain circuits sort of increase. And we think it's these brain circuits that really are involved in driving the behaviors related to addiction. So we call this kind of experiment Q exposure uh, paradigms. Um, and what I created as part of my PhD with our team is a specific cure activity paradigm for gambling addiction. So we wanted to see whether in behavioral addictions, it was similar to what was seen in substance use addiction. So is the very sight of gambling related videos enough to trigger these brain circuits? So that was the first question. And therefore, is that kind of a motivating factor to gamble? But then secondary to that, to that we wanted to see whether other naturally rewarding clips such as food, social or nature, whether those primary rewards, whether the brain responded less to, or whether it was kind of different to patients or to individuals that didn't have gambling addiction. Um, and so we did a documentary maybe two years ago now with Paul Merson, who um, was very brave and came out with, you know, he has been very open about his gambling addiction. And, and we wanted to scan his brain and understand, or, well, he wanted to have his brain scanned using our task. And I'll talk you through some of the results that we, sh that we saw. So this was Paul's brain um, when we scanned it um, in response to food related cues. Um, and if I get a little laser pen or highlighter, oh, um, oh, sorry, that was the wrong one. There's the laser pointer. So if you can see the laser pointer over here, um, this part of the brain over here is the kind of main ventral striatum, which is the core reward processing region. And the front part of the brain over here is the frontal cortex. And essentially in addiction, there's a kind of misbalance between this part of the brain and this part of the brain. Essentially, the reward system overtakes and it basically sends signals up to the front part of the brain saying, this is really important for my survival. Go out and do the behavior. And it's the frontal parts of the brain that reason whether or not to do it. So essentially what this shows is that in at least Paul's brain in comparison to food, he wasn't finding it very rewarding. And he actually said when he looked at some of the videos, he didn't really find it that pleasurable. In response to social cues, which um, individuals that are considered to be healthy find quite stimulating or rewarding, we often see kind of structures over here, which are kind of reasoning about social reward. And, and there was none of that either in Paul. Um, and then in nature related cues, so pictures of beautiful sceneries, um, again, we didn't see much activity in the visual cortex or areas of the brain like the insula that process kind of natural rewards. Um, but when we showed him videos related to gambling, you can see quite clearly here that these core brain reward regions which were associated with reward are essentially lit up very robustly. His visual attentional networks at the back of the brain are very lit up, which shows its brain is really interested in it. And you can see these front parts of the brain over here, see so the medial prefrontal cortex. These are involved in essentially kind of regulating responses um, to how to control reward seeking. And essentially these have been upregulated and that upregulation means go, it means, you know, engage in a behavior. So essentially what this shows is that even just merely, you know, the passive viewing of video clips is enough to trigger 
Paul's brain into uh, engaging in gambling like behaviors. So what we want to understand, I guess, for the first time, so these are very, this is a very novel way of looking at the brain. It's one of, one of the very few studies that have looked at how the brains of individuals with gambling respond to salience cues. So we've established what we call biomarkers of gambling addiction. And what we want to kind of understand now is whether psilocybin can actually restore some of these kinds of pathological biomarkers in the brain. Is it that psilocybin can actually kind of dampen down the response that we see to gambling videos and restore some of the kind of hypo functioning that we see in response to um, some of these um, other cues here? So essentially what we want to understand is whether psilocybin therapy can kind of expand this kind of state of um, broad, broadened consciousness um, and whether there's a kind of carryover effect. Um, Another way that we can also look at the brain is looking at neuroplasticity. So another thing that I did um, with some colleagues of mine um, and a master student, Max Nerny, um, is to look at how plastic the brain is. So um, again, this is quite neuroscience heavy, so I won't go too much into it, but essentially neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to learn new things and to adapt and change. And the idea is that in addiction, you get kind of an overlearning of behavior and it's hard to kind of break those habits or learn new habits. And so we wanted to understand in gambling disorder, whether there was a kind of change in the way that the brain tissue itself can take on board new information. Um, and what you can see over here in one of the tasks, which was basically trying to investigate whether the brain was able to respond quickly to new stimuli, is that there's an almost blunting of response to taking on board new information. So you can see the red over here, there's a reduced peak um, and that reduced peak of set versus healthy control shows that the brain is kind of less responsive to onboarding new information. So the interpretation of that is that it's kind of not as plastic or neuroplastic um, as, as individuals um, that are considered to be healthy. Another way of looking at the brain is looking at the predictive processing power. Is the brain able to predict what happens in the future? Is it able to predict what's going on in the environment? And you can see here um, in red um, that individuals with a gambling addiction um, the predictive processing power isn't the same as those with healthy controls. And our interpretation of this is that perhaps individuals with gambling disorder have decreased neuronal strength to predict things. This might be related to the fact that they have these repeat exposures to near misses and losses. And so the brain essentially blunts its response to unexpected outcomes. And so what this might actually translate to in the real world is that they have these kind of aberrant relationship with rewards. They don't respond to natural rewards in their environment as well. They really only respond to gambling rewards. The brain just don't really kind of pick up on their kind of environmental stimuli, which kind of traps them. And so that makes sense, at least on a kind of psychological and clinical level. But I think the most interesting thing we found here was there seemed to be this correlation between PGSI scores. So that's scores uh, related to how severe the gambling addiction was and um, how kind of the predictive processing power. So the, the individuals that had the highest scores uh, in gambling severity also had um, the greatest sort of reductions in, in predictive processing power in the brain. So this correlation is near significant, um, but I think we'll be replicating this in, in large sample sizes. What we essentially might be able to find is a biomarker. So a very simple task, which takes about 20 minutes, which can actually kind of predict how severe someone's gambling is. So again, with this task, what we want to understand is can psychedelics restore and rebroaden um, an individual's brain, essentially? Can it really solve both the salience network processing? Can it restore plasticity in the tissues? And the real question that we want to answer is, is it through the restoration of these pathways in the brain? Is that how they might end up put it in quote unquote cure addiction? And the reason why I put cure addiction there is because I think it's something that's open for debate now um, with the promise of psychedelics. I think historically um, the word cure has kind of been avoided um, but I'm, maybe something to open up the debate to, uh, because actually there is an evidence now from trials that there are some patients that really, you know, don't relapse. And that's something that, you know, addiction treatment hasn't necessarily been able to do. So that's one thing. And might it be doing this 
through this recalibration of the brain, which allows for a rebroadening of the reward spectrum, but ultimately is this underlying the reconnection that individuals have with themselves, with their others, so that, you know, with their family, with their friends, with their social environment, with their work, with their own health, and with the world in which they live. And that is essentially the question of the style of gambling study. So um, we want to determine the tolerability, the feasibility and the efficacy and safety of psilocybin therapy for individuals with gambling disorder. We want to understand the brain mechanisms involved. So those two tasks that I showed you, the EEG test to measure neuroplasticity and the fMRI test to look at how they respond to salient gambling video cues. And we want to understand how these relate to long-term kind of changes in psychological in their psychological mechanisms related to gambling and psychometric and clinical questionnaires. Um, so this is generally the design of the study. So individuals will be screened and will recruit from the National Problem Gambling Clinic. Um, they'll undergo seven days before dosing different kinds of baseline measurements, including a baseline brain scan, different cognitive measures, different questionnaires to kind of phenotype their gambling. They'll have two preparatory sessions with a therapist, both three and one day before dosing, to prepare them for the psilocybin therapy. And they'll be invited to Hammersmith Hospital where they'll have a dosing day, where they'll get a single large 25 milligram dose of psilocybin, uh, which is a dose that we've used in other studies. The day after they have an integration where they sit down with the therapist, they work through what happened in the session, reflect on it. And then a week later, they'll have their second integration and we'll have a follow-up brain scan. So we want to understand within a week, whether there are any brain changes. And then what we'll do is we'll follow them up two, four, eight, and 12, and even six months after dosing and look at how their responses have changed in terms of gambling severity, impulsivity, um, affect, so mood. Um, we'll look at uh, personality changes, psychological changes, and see whether there's a correlation in these brain changes that may be able to predict long-term clinical outcome. And the reason why I think this is important in the long run is because psychiatry has never really benefited from what I call biopsychosocial profiling. Um, it's massively advanced neuro neurological disorders like Alzheimer's. Um, it's, major, it's had major advancements in, in cancer research to the point that now we actually have something that we call predictive, preventative, personalized and participatory, so personalized medicine. Um, and this is where we are at the moment. We're in clinical research. And in clinical research, um, what it's about is combining systems biology, which we're doing in our trial systems, neurophysiology as well, using neuroimaging tools, looking at other scientific research, looking at clinical outcomes. And what we do is we culminate all of these kinds of different, different metrics, and then we can apply different kind of AI and, and machine learning programs in order to really understand how we can personalize psychedelic drug development to optimize it for patients. Um, so to summarize, because um, I know we've only got about 10, 10 minutes left, I want to start by saying psychedelics are not a magic bullet and not all patients will benefit. We still don't know how they work in addiction and they have never been formally trialed in gambling disorder. So this is a world first proof of concept and pilot study. So we're going to enter this um, agnostically, um, but we're going to enter it using a lot of data, as I mentioned, to try really understand the mechanisms of action of how this works. And through doing so, we want to basically establish a framework that allows this 4P principle. So developing predictive medicines, preventative, personalized and participatory. And the hope of this is that if we start using this kind of uh, thesis and model, it will improve the drugs that come to line in terms of after the clinical trial period in five or six years from now. We'll be able to understand new receptor pathways and systems that may better explain addiction, may better explain the method of action of psychedelics. But ultimately, this, this approach, which we call translational neuropsychopharmacology, really underpinned the psychedelic era. It was, it was brain imaging research at our center, which encouraged both regulators and the home office, and even as a scientist, that perhaps this was a good thing to do in depression because it targeted areas of the brain involved in depression. And so using these kind of same theses and principles, we want to understand whether it targets core reward structures, uh, which are very critical and central to addictions, both behavioral and substance use. Um, and the reason why it is important is, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, 
patients will be benefit because there is the highest treatment gap in all addictions and there's currently no licensed pharmacotherapy for behavioral addictions uh, and so these treatments will be used, these this, these tools will be used in our early phase clinical studies in gambling addiction but we'll also be using some of these tools in our opiate trial uh, that i mentioned um so um a bit of an overview of what i've spoken about because i know i can it, I can understand it's quite quite a lot to pack into that time. Uh, it was written in this paper over here. So um, if you're interested in reading more, it's open source. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about the research I described, you can drop me an email or uh, follow me on Instagram or Twitter where I'll uh, post about talks I do um, in this area. And I've left some uh, notes over there. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to uh, open up to any questions. Thanks so much, Ryan. That was, yeah, it's really, really fascinating research that you're doing and really, really important um, work. And, and I've learned a huge amount from, from that. And I think this is one of the um, uh, webinars that I'll definitely be going back to the video and watching it uh, multiple times. Um, so we've got some time, we've got about 10 minutes, I think, for questions. We were going to try and wrap up by about five to two to give everybody time to get on with um with that days so i'm going to hand over to vanessa who's going to moderate the um q a for us um and and try vanessa will try to be as equitable as possible in terms of uh getting through as many questions as we can in about if we could wrap up by about five to two vanessa that would be great yep absolutely um thanks ever so much ryan it's really fascinating and i don't think we will get through all the questions um but just to start off with, um, we've had a question about um, gambling being sometimes codependent with alcohol and could psychedelic support someone who's experiencing both harm from gambling and alcohol? Yeah, um, definitely. So uh, I think it's out for the jury in terms of we need to do the research, but uh, some of the strongest evidence in addiction uh, research with psychedelics is with alcohol addiction. Um, and so there's a phase three clinical trial that's uh, starting now. Um, and it's likely in the next two years that, you know, if, the, if that trial goes well, uh, but that will be uh, a licensed treatment for alcohol addiction. Um, and I think we all know that, um, you know, there's a lot of comorbidity. In fact, I think it's about 60% of individuals with gambling addiction have some form of comorbidity at some point during their um, their journey. And so it would be really interesting to, to see. But the mechanism is probably very similar uh, to what I mentioned before in this kind of recalibration of the reward system, which we now know that uh, individuals with substance use conditions like alcohol and gambling, they share a lot of the kind of similar features. So uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, an area where I see it helping both, both, both addictions. Thank you. And also another question, is there a gender difference um, in results with psychedelics used in addiction support? We, I don't think there's been studies which have been powered enough to look at the differences between gender. Um, I know that they have been studied in both male and female subjects. Um, it would be interesting to see. I, at least I know in gambling addiction, there is a very different clinical presentation between males and females. Um, from what some of my clinical colleagues have suggested and I've read about. Um, and so, um, yeah, it could be that there might be different types of treatments that are needed based on gender. We just don't know that yet. Okay, and um, quite a, a mechanistic um, question. Um, how can serotonergic, uh, sorry, serotonergic agonist reduce contractions? Do they just make everything else salient? quite a technical question. Yeah, so, so the way that we think that it might uh, change the way that the salience network works um, is, okay, so I can, maybe I'll go a bit technical. So the reward system, uh, you have um, the mesolimbic dopamine system and in between sort of the core reward hub, which is called the striatum, that kind of fires off dopamine in response to things that are salient. So in a gambler, when they see gambling, uh, vid video or clip or even if they're playing their, their systems will be over firing um, and essentially you have a projection to the frontal cortex which is the glutamatergic synapse and essentially it's the, the kind of front bit of the brain which says stop don't gamble or, or go 
Um, and what we think has happened is that is that in that pathway, there has been a reduction in this, the ability of that frontal cortex to kind of give a signal to um, say to that striatum to reduce its firing. So on that pathway sit this specific serotonin to a uh, receptor, which psychedelics bind to. So what we think could be happening is that when the psilocybin binds to those receptors on this kind of descending pathway, what it might be able to do, and there's been some preclinical work, is that it changes the way that dopamine and the nucleus accumbens and the ventral striatum signals. So instead of the kind of dopamine firing being very kind of phasic, it can kind of, uh, it can kind of relax the way that that, that that brain network fires. So what we're trying to establish is whether um, the way that those core reward hubs function in terms of responsivity to environmental stimuli, we think that actually at a very biological level, the interaction of psilocybin may potentiate dopamine signaling deep in the brain. Um, and, and it's through the investigations that I mentioned. So some of these fMRI studies will be able to answer at least part of that question, um, although not entirely. We'll have to do some PET imaging studies, but we may also do that as well if we get funding for it. But the key, the key question that we want to answer is if by recalibrating dopamine, um, and the dopaminergic response to gambling, does it then allow that, that brain system to re-engage with reward? We don't really know why that would happen. It might be because it disengages the salient system from the executive um, sort of attentional networks. That might be one, one explanation. We, we simply don't know, but um, it's, it's really something that we're gonna try and answer over the next three years. Great, thank you. I've just got, I think I can probably squeeze in just two more questions. Um, this one is, I guess, slightly methodological. Um, how critical are the preliminary therapeutic sessions in relation to outcomes? Could someone, for example, self-medicating outside of a trial expect similar results if they entered the process with the intention to resolve their addiction? I think I want to start by saying that I don't advise anyone to self-medicate um, outside of any clinical trial with any supervision from trained therapists. Um, there are specifics to how this works in terms of guidance and therapy. Preparation is very key. Integration afterwards is also, we think, probably more important um, in order to maintain long-term benefit. Um, so that there has to be, yeah, there has to be kind of a clinical supervision there. Um, so I think that answers, um, sorry, can you just, I don't know whether I fully answered, what was the question? Yeah, I mean, essentially it was really how critical are the preliminary therapeutic sessions in relation yeah, to the think, outcome? Yeah. So I, yeah. think, I, think you ha I think you have answered the question. Yeah, so, so and to, be, to, be, to be actually honest with you, we, we've never done it without, we've never, we've never done it without that psychological prep um but for ethical reasons um and you know there is a debate going on right now about the role of psychotherapy or the importance of psychotherapy in psychedelic treatments and there's some organized some individuals who think it's the drug alone some people think it's drug and therapy some people think it's that mainly the therapy and the drug enhances it um but those trials really haven't been done to really answer that question uh, in its entirety. So I think we also, as psychedelic researchers, so quite in its infancy, we need to answer that. Um, but I don't know whether we'll, be, we'll ethically be able to do a study where we just say, right, okay, here's a drug, go, go, go and do it. It would be, I don't want to say never, but you know, you can imagine there are some ethical uh, considerations to think about with that in terms of risk mitigation. Thank you. And there was another question about the importance of the therapeutic encounter. So I think you've partially answered that as well. So thank you for that. And I think the final question, were there any challenges with psychedelic treatment that were specific, specific to gambling disorder and or individuals with gam gambling disorder as a group? So anything specific um, to people, you know, in, in comparison to, for example, treating with treating opioid or um, alcohol addiction? Yeah, so I think there is, um, and we're really kind of figuring it out right now. So I'm working with the National Problem Gambling Clinic, and we're actually currently in process of trying to understand how we can fit our framework into their current treatment plan. So they have CBT, uh, they have a CBT path model, 
Um, they've got a psychodynamic model, which is kind of done after. They have a phase one treatment, phase two, they have group. We're really trying to figure out where psychedelic therapy might fit into kind of, you know, the stages of treatment that they offer. Um, and there is a specificity because we don't know, for example, you know, the, in the first phase of treatment, for example, there's a lot of kind of um, stimulus control. Um, and might it be that it would be better to do psychedelic therapy before stimulus control, or would it be better to do it afterwards and then kind of solidify those thinkings pre-CBT? Is there a kind of a value doing it after CBT to kind of solidify the learnings from CBT in terms of new behavioral and cognitive strategies? What's the role of psychodynamic therapy? I think these are all areas, and this is why I mentioned it's a really is pilot the work we're doing. Um, and part of the research we're doing right now is really trying to establish the best way that we can go on and do continued development so that we can place psychedelic therapy in the best part to optimize the outcome for the patient. I think the honest answer is that it's going to be very variable dependent on the patient. Um, so yeah, a lot to learn. Um, and I think maybe if I came back in a year or so, we'd have better answers. We'll have to invite you back then. I think that's probably a time to wind it up with the questions. Uh, I know some of the questions weren't fully answered um, because I grouped some of them together, but hopefully um, the the groupings meant that most people's questions got answered partially. Um, you answered them very fully, but I didn't manage to get all of the questions to you, but I hope um, that most people got their questions answered. And thank you very much for, for um, putting the questions in and to Ryan for answering them. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, just to say a final thanks to everybody for coming along. Thanks, Ryan. That was really, really interesting. We'd definitely like you to come back in a year and tell us uh, more about it, uh, about your findings, because this feels like it's been a, a fantastic um, insight into some of this really cutting edge research. So, yeah, thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, and keep an eye out for our future events as well at the Hub. We'd love to see some of you there. So thanks very much and, and have a good afternoon. Goodbye.